We are at the Harp Irish Pub in Meridian, Idaho. It is time once again for Catholic Cocktails. It is another episode of this wonderful video series being produced by Salt and Light Catholic Radio. You're watching us on YouTube and welcome back. We have a fun show for you today. Uh, again, this is the show where we uh, drink some wonderful cocktails. <laughs> some dranky drinks. <laughs> yeah, with uh, some of our more famous saints in the Catholic faith. And yep. it all comes from this book here, Drinking with the Saints by Michael P. Foley. Way to pat yourself on the back there. <laughs> this wonderful show. <laughs> <laughs> Having delusions of grandeur. Hey, one can dream, all right? <laughs> so each week we will be talking with Teresa Zapata, our resident saint expert, and she'll be sharing with us the feast of that week's saint, or maybe the saint's feast days on the day that we release the episode. So she'll tell us about the saint. We'll bring it back here after we do our little intro. And then we'll talk about the drink, try the drink, have our bartender make the drink, uh, and then talk about what Teresa shared with us and kind of have a little conversation about that. Yeah. Well, this week we are highlighting St. John the Baptist. Mm. And of course, most of us know that St. John was born to St. Elizabeth. She, of course, was the cousin of our Blessed Mother. So... Uh, one of the most influential figures in the church and one of our greatest Catholic saints. Indeed, indeed he is. What a guy, what a guy. Uh, the cocktail we're going to be making today, of course, the grasshopper. Ah, makes Classic. sense. Classic. Uh, the reason behind this pairing, obviously, he was eating locusts out in the desert, but we didn't want to do that today, and it's yeah. not on the menu at the harp. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not that brave. Thank Lord, right? <laughs> So uh, rather than, um, you know, eating locusts today, we thought we would have this delicious classic drink. Mm. And it's easy to make. It's got some cream. We have some cream to mint, mm -hmm. which we had a bit of a bad experience <laughs> with last week. So we're going to we'll try it again. Goes. I think yeah. it's going to go much better. Yeah, I'm excited. And uh, some cream to cacao. Cacao. <laughs> which is basically <laughs> chocolate liqueur. So I'm thinking, you know, one of those after dinner mints that oh, we yeah, enjoy at the say, finer like restaurants. Like a, or even like the chocolate mint ones at Pizza pizza places you know okay. the, the soft mints butter mint things there you go anyway so the uh, materials that you're going to need for this drink are a shaker some ice um and a rocks rocks glass is rocks that how, glass, okay okay yeah. that's how it's pronounced i wasn't sure yeah. uh, or you can do a martini glass it's up to you but yeah all right well we know what we're making how we're going to do it so let's send it over to our area expert on the saints here's Teresa zapetta <laughs> on the solemnity of the nativity of saint john the baptist june 24th we'd like to raise a glass for the birthday of saint john the baptist we all know about birthdays there's the cake and the ice cream but it's also appropriate to toast the birthday boy and in this case the birthday boy is saint john the baptist Indeed, St. Augustine notes, and I'm quoting St. Augustine here, this day of the nativity is handed down to us and is the day celebrated. We have received this by tradition from our forefathers and we transmit it to our descendants to be celebrated with like devotion. I can't think of any more encouragement than that by St. Augustine himself to celebrate this birthday of St. John the Baptist. There are only three birthdays that are celebrated in the church. The birthday of Jesus, the birthday of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the birthday of St. John the Baptist. John the Baptist's father was Zachariah of the priestly clan. And his mother, Elizabeth, was a descendant of Aaron. It says that they were just in the eyes of God and faithful followers of the commandments and all the ordinances of the Lord. And yet, they were childless. I say, and yet, because back in the day, if you were barren, if you had no children, that was considered a reproach. However, that was going to change. It's Zachariah's turn to offer incense at the altar. And the people are outside praying. 
while he goes in to offer this incense and incense and who's there on the right side of the altar is the angel Gabriel. The, G Gabriel will identify himself as angel Gabriel. And he says to Zechariah, God has heard your prayers. Your wife is going to conceive and bear a son. Zechariah says, how am I to know this? I am an old man and my wife is too advanced in years. Well, how is he going to know this? Well, Gabriel says, you will be struck dumb. That is, you won't be able to speak until these events take place because you have not trusted my word. And so Gabriel leaves. Zechariah comes out unable to speak. The people know something was going on because he was in there for a while. He comes back mute and goes back home and Elizabeth does conceive. Mary learns of this when the angel Gabriel comes to announce that she will be the mother of God. And she says, Elizabeth, your kinswoman, she who was thought to be infertile is now six months pregnant because nothing is impossible with God. So Mary goes off to um, help Elizabeth. And Elizabeth reports that the moment Mary's greeting hears, enter, here, touches her ears, the child within her leaps in her womb. And Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and recognizes the mother of my Lord. Mary then prays with the great prayer of praise, the Magnificat. Then we go to John's birth. It's the time of the circumcision. And they're asking Elizabeth, since Zachariah can't say anything, what do you name this child? And she responds, John. And there's lots of objection from the relatives. John, there's no John in the family. Name him Zachariah after his father. Zachariah motions for a writing tablet and writes, his name is John. And with that, Zechariah is able to speak and he praises God with the prayer, the canticle of Zechariah. The chapter ends saying that the child grew up, matured in spirit, and went off to the wilderness until the time of his public appearance. Now, fast forward 30 years after the birth of Jesus. John appears out of the wilderness, preaching repentance. He's baptizing on the Jordan, and he prepares for and announces the coming of the Messiah. We're going to learn how to make grasshoppers, which is appropriate for the fact that when John was in the desert, he ate locusts. I'm so much happier to be drinking a grasshopper instead. We are here at the Harp Irish Pub in Meridian, and again, we are going to make the grasshopper, which is a classic. And we have uh, superstar bartender Joe with us again here at the Harp. We've got all the ingredients in front of us. So show us how to make a grasshopper. So similar to last week, you're going to want to start off with an ounce of creme de menthe. Um, but this time with an ounce of creme de cacao. And so because we don't have the white version, we're just using the plain version because it's just chocolate. And in a surprising turn of events, it actually calls for two ounces of heavy cream. So this oh. is basically like you're having a, like mint chocolate ice cream right. in a drink, essentially. And when it comes to garnish, you can do several different types of garnishes. You can top off the foam with a um, with cinnamon, with nutmeg, or in this case, going to be using some shaped chocolate. Nice. <laughs> Just to make it a little bit fancier. Looking this is more forward of a to that. dessert drink. Yeah. All right. Well, this is going to be much better than last week's disaster. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. So Joe's going to make us the drink right now. This is the classic, the grasshopper. Okay. So first step you're going to want to do is you're going to take your cocktail glass or Rots glass and you're going to want to chill it. And so the way that you chill is by filling it up ice with a little bit and then just giving it a nice, like rigorous spin. That way it chills the glass. And then once that's chilled, then put a small scoop of ice in it. And then after that, same as usual, you take your shaker, put some ice in. And as the recipe suggests, we're going to be doing an ounce of cream de menthe, the spearmint toothpaste. 
then we're going to be doing an ounce of chocolate. And because this is such a cream heavy drink, it then calls for two ounces of heavy cream, which can be half and half or whatever creamer you have at home, really. And then once that's all done, do exactly as we do most of the time. Shake it, bop it. And so because this is a very cream filled drink, I want it to be thicker than usual cocktails. It should be very nice and foamy when it comes out. So then you put your strainer on, pour it over the glass, and then you basically just get liquid ice cream. And then once that's done, you then take everything away. And now, unlike the other cocktails that we've done previously, this one actually might taste good. And so because of that, you want it to make it be fancy for the customer or for yourself at home. Because you have something kind of special to show off in your like, you know, cocktail parties, you know, drink responsibly, but you know. And then just put nice little bit of shavings of chocolate on it. And there you go. And then top off with some straws. And you got your drink. Voila. Again, we are filming at the Harp Irish Pub in Meridian. And special thanks to Jamie, Bartender Joe, and all the great staff that has been taking care of us here these mm -hmm. past few weeks. Well, the Grasshopper... A success. Amen. Hallelujah. Finally, we were wondering <laughs> if we were going to get a good drink or not, but that we're one was gold. We're just <laughs> this one is fantastic. If you like mint chocolate chip ice cream, please order this. Incredible, in my opinion. I could drink like a gallon of this stuff. Like if they sold it at the store, you just <laughs> cereal. I'm telling you. Fantastic. We had to practice some restraint to make sure there was something <laughs> left in the glass for the closing <laughs> shot <depressing>. here. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, our last call today, let's talk about what Teresa said. Right, and uh, right. apparently, according to Teresa, there's only three birthdays that are celebrated in our Catholic faith. And that, of course, is Jesus right. and Mary and St. John the Baptist. Okay, hmm. okay. So I think today we could talk a little bit about like celebrations and how we approach those. Yeah. Because um, as you know, in the Catholic Church, there are a lot of celebrations. We party all the time. <laughs> I don't think we stop partying. No, honestly. we don't. Except for twenty four seven. Even in Lent, actually. Yeah. Because a few they in have there. those feast days in there, and they're like, "Oh, it's fine. You can still party." And they're like, <laughs> "Oh, right, right, right." But um, so, how do you like approach celebrations in your family? Um, usually, there's food involved, oh, and well, uh, usually <laughs> a drink or two. <laughs> or two. So, but it is a celebration. It's all about family and friends and laughter mm -hmm. and uh, especially birthday parties. Since we're talking about birthdays, birthdays today. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so how do you celebrate your birthday and maybe take stock in um, those relationships that you have with your family and friends and how you approach celebrations? How about yeah. you? Um, kind of the same for us. I think it just depends on which family member and what they like to do, right. you know, because sometimes you got to think about those uh, love languages, right? What, mm -hmm. what makes them feel loved? You know, for me, it might be someone doing an act of service for me or spending time with me. Other people like gifts. So I think if, if we know what their love language is and we try to approach the celebration from that angle. Yeah. So. And of course, at my birthday, we would be serving grasshoppers. For a 10-year-old, not so much. Maybe not. So, so you might so want to customize it a little bit <laughs> <laughs> according to age. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the grasshopper, fantastic drink. We would highly recommend Absolutely. it. Much better than the locust that St. John the Baptist ate out in the desert. It's not as crunchy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe some of the chocolate shards on top were a little crunchy, well, but uh, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> it was delicious for sure. Um, also, part of our last call, besides the delicious grasshopper, mm -hmm. maybe it's not your thing, but there were some other things that we could try in yes. celebration of this feast day. Yes. So you mentioned earlier um, how his diet consisted of locusts and honey, right? So. Uh, if you are not interested in the creme de menthe option, you can also try a honey whiskey. There's honey bourbon. There's honey wine. There's honey 
quart. There, I mean, it, the list wow. goes on and on and on. So if you're into honey-based drinks or that sweet honey flavor, I would recommend you try one of those. All right. Well, that'll wrap up this episode. And uh, thank you for watching. And mm -hmm. we hope to uh, see you again here next week. Next week, we are going to be talking about Saints Peter and Paul mm -hmm. and another classic, a good old-fashioned martini. martini. So if you're a gin fan... Pay attention to next week because <laughs> it's a party. Please make sure to subscribe and follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and all that kind of stuff. Next time on our Holy Happy Hour, we'll be talking with those, or talking about those two fantastic yep. main men, side men of Christ. That's it'll right. Be, it'll be and time. Teresa will be telling us all about them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe's going to be making them behind the bar here. So can't wait. All righty. Until, Until then. then St. John the Baptist, pray, pray for, for us. us. Cheers. Cheers, everybody.